In the early 80s, 1980, 81, 82, I think that art changed and the nature of art became something that, uh, that, be, that has influenced art today but didn't exist before. And what that aspect, that influence was, was TV and specifically cartoons on TV, social commentary through cartoons cartoons like Popeye and Olive Oil, or a, a cartoon like the Chipmunks, or uh, any, of, any of the animals going back and forth, uh, Bugs Bunny. Uh, you, you had a, an onslaught of, of Disney productions, and what happened is it crept into the lives of our children, including me. I was absorbed with cartoons at one time, and I always liked Popeye the Sailor Man the best. And if you look at what came in 1980, 1981, and 1982 with the works of myself, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Richard Hamilton, Paolo Bugiani, Liz and Val, on and on and on and on and on, there's a relationship to cartoons and TV and metaphor and subject matter. I did over 5,000 murals on the streets of New York City. Seven years, I would go to New York for six months, and during that summer six months, I would work virtually 85% of my, my evenings, I would work on the streets of New York City doing graffiti. I had talked before about uh, my involvement with proliferation and my dis distaste for anything that was nuclear. Uh, this stimulated it but it got so that I painted all the time on the streets. I did all of my metaphors from the airplane to the car, to the nuclear landscapes, to the periscope, to the sailboat. Uh, I used everything that I could. Along with doing the works on the streets, I got to know a lot of the artists that were also doing street art and graffiti. And what I started to do was I started to collect. As early as 1983, I was pulling pieces off the walls, pieces off, and so I started a collection. I acquired the Keith Haring Pop Shop sign, uh, the Mickey Mouse right here, I'll show you in a second. Um, Paolo Bugiani's uh, crocodiles and alligators I was able to pick up. Uh, even Linus Caraggio's metal pieces. I was able to take a file and with a chisel and a three pound hammer and bing, bing. Bing, bing, the pieces would come off and they were part of my collection. When we think of New York in 1983, 84, 85, during the graffiti wars, there was so much street art, spray paintings, stencils, um, wheat paste, people putting stuff that they had done in the studio and pasting them up on the, on the, on the walls. There were sculptures, the, the, the city was a little bit inundated. It was flooded with artists all working on the street. Um, and it ran the gamut of individuals. It wasn't just uh, young kids from the South Bronx. It was every age, every society. Um, Jacek Talitsky, for example, is Polish. Liz and Val are Russian and Polish. Paolo Bugiani is Italian. You'd, you'd be surprised that Ken Hiratsuka is Japanese. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people were from around the world that were all doing street art on the streets of New York City at any given time. Let me, let me show you some samples. This is one of the panels, nine panels, that came from the uh, facade of the Keith Haring Pop Shop. Um, it was painted by Andre Charles in collaboration with Keith Haring. Um, I picked it up in 1987 when a construction crew was taking it down. Uh, Paolo Bugiani's piece was done here in 1984 when Paolo was here in, in Orlando doing performances. Uh, we burned a bunch of fire down at that city hall. Uh, another little Paolo Bugiani, uh, a little Ken Hiratsuka uh, boulder. Uh, Ken Hiratsuka was known for uh, doing all the, the carvings on all of the sidewalks in New York City. Um, a Liz and Val, another Liz and Val. This 
piece, these three pieces were on the street uh, down by Canal and Mercer Street around 1983. Um, a fragment from a Paolo Bugiani piece. I've got Bill Kingman, uh, another Ken Hiratsuka, and the one-lined universe where the line never crosses. Another little Paolo Bugiani. I've also, I also have uh, John Ahern, uh, Linus Caraggio, uh, ding, ding, and uh, oh, little Keith Herrings. Um, my friend Paolo Bugiani uh, was on the streets as well during, during the 80s as I, and he was one of the individuals that, that collected quite a few pieces as well. And he had over 50 Keith Herrings, and I'd like to tell you the little story of how he got them. Um, these little Keith Herrings, there was probably more than a thousand that were done, were placed on the black advertising paper in the subways. I had tried to cut them with a knife and pull them off, but was completely unsuccessful. And all at once, uh, Paulo had some, had showed them to me, and the story goes that he was in the subway when he saw the maintenance men taking off all of the advertising paper and putting up new paper to be for new advertising. He asked them what they did with them. They said they'd take them down to the incinerator and burn them. He asked if he could have them. They said yes. He went down to the uh, maintenance area and he said there were piles of them. So he pulled them back, separated the pieces, and that's how he preserved these pieces from K. Perrin. Um, I have these two in my collection. Uh, another piece by Paolo Bugiani, uh, Frost. Um, oh, a couple of my gunboats that were literally uh, on, on the streets that we retrieved during the 1980s. Politically and socially, it was a changing time. A um, whole lot of us were against war. A whole lot of us were for peace. But it was also a time of self-promotion. Uh, prior to that, you kind of had to be sponsored and backed. During the 80s, an artist could go onto the street, paint all night long, and overnight, everyone knew who he was. Maybe not his name, but they knew his imagery. I, too, enjoyed the success of the street artists. Today, I travel all over Europe. I curate all kinds of exhibitions on New York City street art, and I get to go to all kinds of museums, all based on the success and the notoriety that came from the 1980s. New York City, 1983, 1984, 1985. The Graffiti Street Art Wars.